today on the day two of the conference. My name is Savin Kanna, and I'll be talking about integrated quality assessment process or IQA process for ANDIS. In the agenda today, I'll provide background information about the IQA process and what led to the uh, to OPQ, what led to OPQ adopting or implementing the IQA process. It is a team-based review process, so I'll briefly go over roles and responsibilities of different team members. I'll also provide a high-level overview of the timeline for the IQA process as it relates to a 10-month clock ANDA. Uh, since the implementation of the IQA process, there has been some changes made to it. I'll briefly go over these changes and the reasons behind these changes. And finally, summary. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why, what, what happened prior to the IQA process. So prior to the IQA process, the agency was siloed in the way quality reviews were conducted. And what I mean by that is that a typical ANDA would have a drug product reviewer, a micro reviewer, a DMF reviewer, and so on. And each one of these reviewers would work independently. There was very little communication between them. And because of this lack of communication, there were inefficiencies in the final review product of the assessment product. There was also no defined timeline among these reviewers. And what I mean by that is uh, a drug product reviewer could have picked up the application months before and finished their review if, uh, before, before even the micro reviewer picked up their application or the DMF reviewer even picked up the DMF. So this usually ended up, uh, this ended up resulting in delay in action by the agency. And because of this, OPQ was established under CEDA in 2015. It brought all these quality sub-disciplines together under one umbrella in order to create a single unit for quality recommendation. And in order to now bring all these different quality sub-disciplines together on one table so they can communicate, they can collaborate, they can agree upon timelines, IQA process was implemented. Uh, this helped, this increase in communication and collaboration helped create more patient-focused and risk-based quality recommendations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the people who are involved in the IQA process, the IQA team members. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll go over their roles and responsibilities. So a typical IQA team has two co-leads, the application technical lead and then the regulatory business process manager. They work very closely with each other and are always in constant communication. As a matter of fact, they're just located one floor away from each other. So they're always in each other's offices. Then we also have the drug product reviewer or assessor. They're responsible for looking at the uh, characteristics of the finished drug dosage form and in intermediates. We have the DMF assessor. There could be one or more of uh, the DMF assessors depending on how many DMFs are referenced for any given ANDA. Then we have the process assessor. As the name suggests, they're responsible for looking at the uh, manufacturing process of the finished drug dosage forms or any intermediates. Then we have the facility assessor. They look at, they provide the assessment of all the facilities that are listed for any given application. We have the biofarm reviewers who look at the, the solution methodology. And they're usually pulled into the IQA team when there's a oral, a solid oral dosage form. Then we also pull in a micro reviewer if it's a sterile product. And we also have started to, we also have ORA investigators as part of the IQA team or their representative. And this has helped to align the desktop review and the inspection piece together. Uh, this is what a typical a core IQA team looks like. But we could also pull in reviewers or assessors from other offices depending on the need of the application. Uh, for example, if it's a medical device, we could pull in an assessor from CDRH. So this slide over here shows us, uh, gives us a view of where each one of these team members are located within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. The RBPM, who's one of the co-lead, is, lo is located in Office of Program and Regulatory Operations. The ATL, the second co-lead, and the Drug Product Reviewer are located in Office of Life Cycle Drug Product. Office of Process and Facility has three of the reviewers, a facility, micro, and process. The DMF, or the drug substance, and the biofarm reviewers are in Office of New Drug Products. And the yellow star represents the other offices that we can pull in depending on the need of the application. So let's go in a little bit, a little bit talk a little bit more in depth about the responsibility of these team members. The RBPM. He's mainly, they're mainly responsible for tracking the progress of the review throughout the review cycle. You can think of them as a navigation in a car. 
they help navigate the IQA team to their destination. This could be any internal or external GADUFA goal dates or any internal dates. There are also points of contact for any communication that is needed with the applicant uh, from the IQA team members. These are usually the information requests or the discipline review letters. There are also points of contact for other offices within the agency if there are any questions about the quality portion of the answer. They also organize and facilitate meetings. These could be kickoff meeting, any internal mid-cycle meeting, or any ad hoc meeting requested by any of the IQA team members. They maintain administrative records. They make sure all the quality subdiscipline reviews are complete and archived appropriately in our internal system. And they also keep other stakeholders informed about the status of the assessment. And this is usually uh, the RPM. We are in constant touch with them. We let OGD know uh, what the status of the uh, quality portion of the ANDA is. ATL, who is the other co-lead, is mainly responsible for the scientific or the technical content of the review. They also work very closely with the IQA team members and our BPMs and help identify any issues and resolve those issues, address those issues. They're also responsible to make sure that there are no gaps and overlaps in any IRs or DRLs that are being issued. So what typically happens is each quality subdiscipline will provide their deficiencies to the RBPM. The RBPM will compile these deficiencies and we will get the last okay from the ATL to make sure there's no gaps and overlaps. And finally, uh, ATL is also responsible for providing the final OPQ recommendation in an OPQ, in an executive summary, which will eventually move to OGD. So every quality, uh, quality sub-discipline has a primary reviewer. Uh, they are usually the first one to do in-depth assessment of their respective discipline. Uh, since they are the first one to do in-depth assessment of their respective discipline, they're usually the first one to raise issues and identify any potential solutions to the management and IQA team, keeping them informed. They also identify and raise any precedent-setting issues to management and IQA team. And they have also been participating in inspections. Uh, this has helped us a little bit, I would say. Uh, in, this is usually a case if they're reviewing something and they find something that they think is very important for them to understand or need to verify, they might join the ORA in investigating an investigation. So for uh, every quality primary uh, reviewer, we might also have a secondary reviewer. These are usually a little bit more senior reviewers. They provide clear direction to primary reviewers, meeting them regularly throughout the review cycle multiple times and providing their feedback. They also provide concurrence on the recommendation that the primary reviewer provided. They identify and raise precedent setting issues as well in case the primary reviewer missed it. They also help resolve conflict related to in their respective discipline area. So this image over here kind of gives us a picture of the kind of collaboration and communication that is going on between the IQA team. There's a constant flow of information between different disciplines, sub-disciplines, and in the middle we have ATL and RBPM to make sure that everybody is on the same page and they're, in, they're, they're on target to meet their deadlines. Okay, so let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about the timeline. I know Vince talked a little bit about the bigger picture of the end from the OGD side. This is specifically for the IQA process in OPQ. So let's say an ANDA is, ANDA is submitted by the an applicant, and typically the filing reviewer will pick up the application and initiate their review. While they're reviewing their, the application, OPQ will simultaneously get the assignment for the application, and we will identify the, the core IQA team members. We will hold a kickoff meeting once we have identified the team members. And this is where they would align any roles and responsibility, agree on timeline, and raise any issues that they see very visible. They will also identify early IRs and issue consults early on. This all is done before a filing review decision has been made. So typically, a filing decision is made at around month two, but it could be done earlier. Once, we have, once the ANDA has been found acceptable for filing, the IQA team will start the review of the application and issue IR on as-needed basis. There could be one or more rounds of IRs, and uh, this will keep on going until our next milestone, which is at month six, which is the DRL letter, or the discipline review letter. This is when we will have a substantial review of the ANDA complete, and we will issue the letter to the applicant. 
once the applicant has responded to the DRL, we will review the response to the DRL and issue any additional IRs on an as-needed basis. This will keep on going, the, the cycle for IR will keep on going up until month nine when each quality subdiscipline is expected to provide their final recommendation. Uh, at this time, ATL will take over, the, take over the application and they will do a final look at all the reviews and provide the OPQ final recommendation to OGD at around month nine and a half. From there, OGD will make sure all the regulatory stuff has been taken care of and they will take the appropriate action by month 10. So this was a very high level um, overview of what an IQA process looks like. It did not always look like this. There has been some changes made to it. I'll briefly go over these changes. Uh, the majority of the changes that happened are at the tasks that we're doing prior to filing now. This is identifying the IQA team members, holding the kickoff meeting, agreeing upon a timeline, and issuing any consults, pulling other people in for subject matter expertise we might need. So the reason behind this was we realized that if we have all this stuff ready prior to filing, as soon as the filing decision is made, we can go ahead and get the ball rolling. And this will allow us more time towards the end, tail end of the review cycle to issue more IRs, which will hopefully lead to more first cycle approvals. And also with the implementation of uh, BDUFA 2, we have now the DRL letter, DRL letter as part of the timeline. In summary, uh, IQA process maximizes each team member's expertise. It enhances staff communication and collaboration by bringing the, all these experts together on one table multiple times throughout the review cycle. Allows for agreement on timeline, so everybody's working towards a common goal. Improves uniformity in the deficiencies issued by the applicant, to the applicant. This is usually, I feel like this has, the role of ATL has helped a lot with this since they are looking at all the deficiencies combined together and looking for any gaps and overlaps. And in the end, IQA process helps us deliver one quality voice. And that's all I have today for you guys. And I believe there's question and answer next. So I'll take the best seats. <laughs> <laughs>